in blue here we have the EIP um, in the blue line on the graphs, uh, the EIP, <laughs> and then when we looked at the percent of blossoms that actually had Erwinia present on them, we actually found that there was a delay of about a day or so in this when we uh, looked at uh, the uh, blossoms that actually had uh, uh, Erwinia amalavra on the surface. So with rootstock blight, if you had a lot of fire blight in your orchard at one point in time, you've probably had rootstock blight, but you might not have known it. What rootstock blight is, is you get an infection in the scion, and you see your blossom blight, and you see your strikes. Some of those bacteria can travel down through the tree without causing visible symptoms. So you won't see them moving. And what happens is those bacteria will get into the rootstock, and if it's a susceptible rootstock, they can cause disease. And you see this in trees younger than 10 years old. At some point, your orchard will become resistant, and we don't know why. There's a new generation. There's a new generation of newer, much more active SI materials coming along the pipeline in later stages of development. And it will be a little confusing for those uh, to, to explain that those SIs still can do a good job even in episcap control. And I dragged you down here to see one of the trees that has not been sprayed in an SI resistant orchard. And this tree has been sprayed with one of the newer SI materials under development. In short, what was what we found this year, as what others are finding, is that the trunk application with the phosphite fungicides doesn't appear to be providing that much benefit. However, if you get the sheet and have a look at the different numbers for early fruit scab, cluster leaf scab, and terminal scab, there appears to be some benefits to certain aspects of the disease. Right behind you here is, uh, there's three trees of rosy gauge, which is uh, one of the plums we named last year. Um, and it's a, uh, a gauge type, although it probably doesn't have uh, the same exact ancestry of gauge. Um, it's a very nice piece of fruit. It gets uh, uh, up to 25% sugar. Um, you can see that it clusters pretty heavily sometimes when it sets well. And it is susceptible to uh, uh, rain cracking and brown rot. You know, there's about 36 wild species native around the world, so we've actually gone to the, the main centers of origin, which are Asia and parts of Europe. But I wanted to point out that there are some species native to North America. This one that I'm holding up, to pass that around, is Malus ioensis. That's native to the area east of the Mississippi in North America. Very unique uh, type uh, species. And then I've got here... This is a species which is uh, native to uh, the west coast of North America from uh, coastal Alaska, uh, California all the way up to Alaska, Malus fusca. This is a species, one of the species we collected in China. Notice how closely related these are. There's speculation that uh, this may have moved to North America through the land bridge around 12,000 years ago. Now, I'm pretty excited about cherries, and I've been working on them for about 10 years. You'll see some of our older trials, but I wanted to stop here at this young block in a second leaf. This happens to be part of a study we're doing in New York, Michigan, California, and Washington to try to compare how cherries grow in the different climates and whether or not we can get uh, fruit size here and how to manage them. I only use that as a backdrop to talk about how to develop a cherry tree. Now cherry trees, if you've ever been a cherry grower, are very what we call apically dominant, meaning that the top buds on the tree, whether you head it or whether it's left unheaded, whatever the top buds are, they grow rapidly and dominate all the buds below it. So you tend to get three or four branches at the very top and then nothing below it. These bacteria are common inhabitants of plant surfaces. Pseudomonas syringi syringi, I'll call it PSS for short. <coughs> The bacteria inhabits the leaf surfaces of the plant. It is very happy as an epiphyte. And what causes it to become a pathogen is well, somewhat of a mystery. But it needs wounds and it needs natural openings to invade the plant. It likes cool and wet conditions. This year was not a very good year for bacterial canker. Well, first of all, by show of hands, who... 
who are not familiar with uh, who is not familiar with uh, apple rootstocks? Good. So I don't have to tell you what they are. Uh, well, today it's a special occasion because we have uh, Dr. Jim Cummins, who is the uh, uh, the initiator of this program. Uh, what? 35 years ago? Almost 40 years ago. 1968. Almost 40 years ago, and and you had the, for the first student was uh, Gardner. Uh, was was he was he the first one that worked on fire blight? Randy Randy Gardner. Randy Gardner. Yeah. His thesis work was on chemical thinning of peaches, and he'd done a number of trials. And um, this is a block where we do some of our peach thinning trials. Now he's moved on to bigger things. So this year we had a visiting scientist named Tae Myung Yoon back here from Korea. And so he's done a lot of the work in this block. But since Jay's the guru on this, we're going to have him talk. Jay? Thank you, Terrence. I received uh, many threats on the bus right over, so I'm going to try to keep this brief for you folks. This block was established actually by some plant pathologists back in 2000, I believe, by Bill Turchek before he left the experiment station. So as horticulturists, we're, we're sort of offended at this extremely low density. And this is to show you, I think the title in the little program is Follow the Money. Keep the spray within the canopy. So what we'd like to do is to show you various ways of keeping the spray in the tree canopy and not letting it drift across to other people's farms. Why should they get benefited from your pesticides? You've paid all that money for them. Have you noticed how they're not going down in price? And so we need to keep the spray in the canopy. The question is, what can we do to achieve large size gala, yet at the same time I have good quality and uh, high yield? Um, over the last couple of years, we have done um, a couple of experiments in this regard. As the nitrogen supply increased from about 8 pounds to 100 pounds per acre per year, cell number, total cell number per fruit increased significantly, whereas the cell size remained essentially the same. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the genesis of the tall spindle. You know, we've been working toward higher and higher densities for years and years. In fact, uh, we've uh, been accused of being in collusion with the nurserymen. We've been working so hard at it. But uh, over the years, as you know, we've established apple planting systems across the state. We started at 6x12 and slender spindle. We've done triple rows. We've done wide trellis. We've done uh, uh, three-wire trellis, low trellis. Uh, we've tried every single planting system that you can imagine, Solax, and the latest two that we've tried is Solax, Super Spindle, and then this Tall Spindle. All the research we've done, if you look back through all the literature, and if you put profitability against tree density, we can see that the most profitable systems have those that have been somewhere between 800, 900 trees to the acre to 1,200 trees to the acre. Two of the ones that we're real excited about are, are this one right here, which is Honey Crisp by New York 752. And that was number one in our formal tasting last year at the Geneva Fruit Showcase. And this one here is uh, Brayburn by New York 674. And uh, both of those are what I would say are in a fairly advanced stage of testing and we're um, fairly excited about. And some growers have seen these. They were in our formal tasting. And um, those are two apples that I think you'll hear more about in the future. I thank the growers in the audience that have been part of our testing network. It's been really helpful. Um, those have come to the uh, showcase that we have. I value your opinion. Whether you think a variety is a dog or whether you think it's the next best thing, um, no, no pun intended for Dennis's uh, cooperative, um, you know, feel free to, to tell us about it. Uh, a couple pests, uh, a foothold, and, and uh, allowed them to become more problematic, and those are the internal worms, codling moth and oriental fruit moth. So this has caused growers to turn to ever more uh, selective programs, specialty insecticides, uh, specialty timings, and then uh, another tactic that, that uh, is incorporated in together with this that I'm going to talk about, which is pheromone disruption, mating disruption. using. <laughs>